corner store and walked in and asked for you know where where I should be going and the lady said well, what what are you here for and I said I'm here for a funeral and she said who who died and I said Dwayne Fisher and she said Dwayne died <laughs> I was like wow you know him she's like yeah so we get to talk and it turns out your classmate uh, <laughs> and uh, you know and then I found out that Dwayne and um, Dwayne and Bonnie met at Mouse River uh, Park so uh, small world so wow. So, uh, welcome everyone. Um, we are here today to celebrate Dwayne Fisher. Um, Dwayne was uh, born to Leonard Fisher and Ora Meyer Fisher at St. Joseph Hospital in Minot, North Dakota. He was born at 4 a.m. on a Sunday, June 22, 1930. Dwayne was preceded in death by his mother and father, Leonard and Ora Fisher his son, Andy Jim Fisher, his brothers, Dick and Kenny Fisher, his sister, Joan Fisher, his wife, Bonnie Fisher, and his daughter, Paula. He's remembered today by his sister, Sally Johnson, his sister, Helen Anderson, his brother, Bruce Fisher, his brother, Jerry Fisher, his son, Douglas Fisher, his daughter, Ronna McLeod, and then far... Uh, I was going to write down names and then about five minutes into it, I was like, no, we're not doing that. Far too many grandkids, great grandkids and friends to name. Let's talk a little bit about Dwayne's life. Leonard, uh, Dwayne's father, was a farmer and, uh, and an inventor. Um, if you didn't know it, uh, he liked to tinker around. And um, I found out in the Family Chronicles that, uh, that Leonard invented disc brakes. So he, he had worked up a prototype and had his son uh, working on it with him and, and the proof of concept worked, but the, the Chronicles say he was just too poor to, to patent it. So uh, unfortunately, you guys could have been millionaires. <laughs> but instead, we're celebrating at Mouse Park. <laughs> Dwayne, if, if you knew him at all, I... I I came up to, uh, to when Bonnie passed, and, and um, we were here, and we were in Dwayne's shop, and he was so proud of all the things that he worked on, and, and all the inventions that he had made, and, and uh, so if you know Dwayne at all, you know he was intelligent, um, you know, tinkerer probably isn't fair, he was really an engineer, and, uh, and so I learned that uh, he hated high school and wanted to be done, and he specifically said in his own words that he felt listened to and respected and appreciated by his parents when they said he didn't have to finish high school and instead could test to go to Walkton State School of Science and Engineering at 16. And, uh, and he qualified easily and, and went to Walkton uh, State School of Science and Engineering from 16 to 18 years old and was trained formally um, to do all of the great things that all of you know about. Um, so he didn't complete high school but obviously that didn't matter because he accomplished so, so much. I um, thought it was funny that he, uh, he said in the Chronicles that he never fooled around with girls until he was 16. And the following paragraph said he met Bonnie at 17. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure what that means. <laughs> Bonnie uh, invited Dwayne to her prom. He didn't, he didn't ask her to go to prom. She asked him. But he was only allowed to go if Dwayne would learn how to dance. So she taught him how to dance before prom. Dwayne married Bonnie Lee Daly on May 4th of 1950. They moved to Oregon fairly quickly for work and to get out and explore life uh, while pregnant with Andy Jim, who was their first child. And that first adventure ended with them moving back to Mohall in short order uh, due to the death of Andy Jim um, from SIDS. After some time recovering in Mohall, they struck out again to Seattle in 1959. And in 1983, they left for Alaska. Well, Dwayne left a year or two before Bonnie for Alaska to gold mine and, and make a fortune. <laughs> In 1998, Dwayne and Bonnie retired to Mohall. They bought a house for one penny, and I heard a funny story. I was told it was a dollar, 
and then I found out it was actually a penny. And uh, unfortunately, because of uh, filing taxes, uh, Bonnie had to pay a dollar. Um, now, this house was completely bought for a penny, paid a dollar, completely renovated for $20,000. And I heard last night that Dwayne was in big trouble because he blew the budget. <laughs> <laughs> Dwayne is described as shy and loyal, but in his own words, I thought it was interesting that the Chronicles shared for each child what their values were. And in his own words, he said that tr being truthful was very important to him. Dwayne Francis Fisher departed this life on Thanksgiving morning 2020 at the age of 90. I'd like to take a couple minutes here and, and actually open it up, and I'd like for you guys to share stories. We, I recorded a, quite a few stories, but as we were talking last night, we thought it'd be better to hear from, from each of you or, or whoever would like to, stories of how Dwayne had impacted your life and things that you appreciate about him. So, um, so let's take a few moments uh, and do that now. So why don't you start? <laughs> well, my grandpa, Dwayne, was like my best friend from the time I could hold on to his finger, and we went, I don't remember childhood without him. We spent all of our time together, did everything, probably the most impactful person in my life. And the fact that, you know, they came back here to retire, and a decade later I was up here and, you know, got to be with him again, it was pretty impressive. My guests, you know, think of your fondest memories with your grandpa to talk about, and I, how do you pick one? How do you, I mean, I spent a lifetime with this man, and he was my best friend. And, I mean, we have stories, we have goofy stories of all of us grandkids doing stupid things, and, you know, he'd get excited every once in a while, but probably the most patient man you would ever know. And, uh, well, I was very, you know, saddened to, to lose him at the same time, I think it was the right time. I don't know what else to say. I mean, he's just, he was great. Don't be shy. If you have a story, come on up. Okay. Yes, he was. Matthew was one of his favorites, and in my generation, Paula was one of his favorites. And I'm going to start. Um, I lost my place. Um, by honoring Dad and sharing uh, Doug's story because he was the oldest and he's in the pole position. And I think it's fair that I should read what Doug had to say. I'm having no issues. These are my memories of my dad. He had so much knowledge on how to figure things out and we all knew everything had to be right according to Dwayne's way. There was only one way. Um, I learned many of life's, life's lessons mostly by observation of my dad and those lessons I used in my trades throughout the years, trucking, rigging, and other various jobs. I, I love being with him in the shop. Some of my most treasured memories were boating, fishing, camping, especially at Hartstein Island. But I, what I love most about my dad is I know he believed in Jesus and that Jesus died for him and is finally with mom, the love of his life. So I, I wanted to uh, also share some stories about my dad because a lot of you kids that are here didn't know my dad and who he was and um, what he did in his life. And, to the generation behind us, he was known as Papa. And um, we're not only honoring Dad's life today, but we're also honoring Paula. And it's been 10 years since Paula passed away, but we have her ashes still. <laughs> <laughs> and she's going to be interred today with Daddy. So I just wanted to share that with people because it's not really typical <laughs> at all, but it's very appropriate because North Dakota was Paula's place and she was daddy's favorite. 
<laughs> and one of the reasons she was daddy's favorite is because she was a tomboy and she would go hunting with him and camping with him and she just loved being with dad and they had a really special bond. Last year was a really difficult year with COVID because dad was turning 90 and we couldn't be with him. That was the milestone that he wanted to make was his 90th birthday. But on his 89th birthday, it was my last visit with my dad. I brought his sister Helen with me and we celebrated his birthday with some of you that are here with us today. And it was really a fun time. And it was hilarious because Jerry said to me, have you seen your dad lately? And I said, no, and he said, well, wait until you see him. He went to the dentist and got all of his teeth pulled, and he didn't get the good end of the stick. <laughs> uh, so my dad as a father was somebody that really did a lot of neat stuff for us kids. And I remember a couple of things specifically. Um, one of them was when I was eight years old, and mom and dad didn't have a lot of money then, but they did such neat things for us kids. They bought used bikes, and we couldn't go down in the basement where dad's shop was because we didn't know this, but he was working on a bicycle. Mine was powder blue, Paula's was red. But you couldn't believe these bikes when we got them for Christmas because they were so beautiful and shiny and new with custom pinstriping that wasn't tape. <laughs> it was the real deal. And Daddy was so meticulous about details. I got to be the beneficiary of his artistic, beautiful metal work. When I was 16, he restored a car that literally came from the bottom of the Green River. And when he got done with that car, it was a show quality car. It was absolutely beautiful. And nobody did metal work like my dad. It was just amazing. Some of his business accomplishments were train brakes, tanks and parts for Boeing airplanes. He collaborated on the first machine that was used in open heart surgery. He created the first paper baler. He worked on robotic irrigation systems and designed and built his brother Dick's vacuum forming machine for his business. He was a first class engineer and I considered my dad a metal artist, not a metal worker. He was meticulous in everything that he did. And I want to share that dad always kept mom waiting most of the time. Mom was really punctual, dad was not. <laughs> And it's kind of fitting that, again, mom is waiting um, for dad. Um, we finally got a headstone. <laughs> so um, it won't be going in today, but it will be going in soon. And it will be amazing that mom and dad will finally be together again with Andy Jim in heaven. And I am so thankful. My story's not quite as long, <laughs> but uh, we came back to North Dakota uh, five years ago, and Rhonda didn't know it at the time, but I was going to ask Dwayne for her hand in marriage. And so we went over to the home and walked in, and we are in this little room there, and so I asked him, and his response was, please take her. <laughs> <laughs> as an engineer, a mechanical mind, and I have had a 29 Ford Roadster that had a, a Y-block V8 in it with a three-speed, and everybody told me I couldn't put a four-speed in that car, and I wanted to do it, so I took the car apart. This, she comes in on this too, Ray Ray. And I'm working on the car underneath the car, and Ray Ray's about this big, 
And she comes in and says, what are you doing, Grandpa? And I says, I'm working on trying to get this transmission in. She crawls up on my chest and lay there and fell asleep. <laughs> so now I got a transmission like this and I got her on my chest. And Dwayne was there in the garage at the time and I couldn't I get the tranny up about that far and it wouldn't go into the bell housing. So I pull it back out and drop it down, pull it out and Wayne's standing there looking at me and looking at the transmission. He says, the bearing collar's too big. It won't fit into the bell housing. So I mic'd it, and it was less than a thousandths of an inch too big to go into the bell housing. So I took the bearing collar off, took it over to the machine shop, had a machine it, and it slipped in like butter. But that's the mind that he had. He could look at something and figure out the solution immediately. Mine's quick. I want to say that Grandpa was a pretty patient man, unless you did not load the dishwasher correctly. <laughs> <laughs> and don't touch the egg pan. <laughs> so, <laughs> I remember being a teenager and they were living with us and I would load the dishwasher and he would stand over me like a hawk and I swear I had to reload the dishwasher 20 times to get it correctly but you had to meticulously do everything so you could fit all the dishes in there in maximum capacity and if you did it did not place everything right it was wrong and you had to take everything out and redo it and I was so frustrated but I find myself doing the same thing to my kids. <laughs> <laughs> they waste the space in the dishwasher, so thank you, Grandpa. <laughs> uh, I just, I was always, we lived with Grandma and Grandpa for a while with Matthew, and I was always jealous of his relationship with Matthew, and I wanted, I wanted to be like Matthew and be in the tractors, and, and I couldn't, but my favorite thing was dancing on Grandpa's toes in the shop with Snoopy around. And he was, he was, uh, he was more like a father to me, and I wasn't gonna cry today until I looked and saw the picture of him walking me down the aisle. So he gave me away on my wedding day. So he holds a special place in my heart forever. <laughs> Okay, so I did not know the dishwasher story, and now my son's over here jabbing me with his elbow, and I'm like, well, apparently that's where I get it from. <laughs> <laughs> because by golly, if you, what are you doing? It's not going to get cleaned like that. You got to do it like that. <laughs> anyway, so that's where I get it from. My memory of Grandpa is just his hugs. Oh my gosh, that man gripped you like he was going to save you from falling off a bridge. Like, you just, he never had to say, I love you. He showed, I love you. Like, I mean, he said it too, but it was, I just, his embraces were just so powerful. So, that's my favorite. See, kind of start with the unscript. <laughs> <laughs> something 
Bruce tells the story of a 54 Chevrolet that happened to have the right engine for it. And Bruce came around uh, six months later and he saw this machine and he was digging ditches with it. And Bruce said, where did that come from? He said, well, that's the car you gave me. How he could do that was, uh, was very special. So uh, I think of both Dwayne, I think of both Bonnie and Dwayne. And I was uh, also reading this, Andrew Jackson, I don't know if you know him, he's a, he was the general, the famous, the president of the United, seventh president of the United States. And uh, he was a tough, tough old general. And uh, he had an interesting saying that he said, you know, heaven will be no heaven to me if I did not meet my wife there. So, So, Bonnie and Dwayne, yeah. It's a white Chrysler van. White Chrysler van. 66 GTO. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. It's already with a cute hanging on the back, right? Yeah. <laughs>
from uh, Dwayne's brothers and sisters and kind of their thoughts about him. So we're going to start with Jerry. He's going to read a few. Yeah, this one is from, uh, we all know her as Sal, her name is Virginia Ann. And Sally says, uh, you know, she said, sorry, I haven't sent anything, but I've had some heart palpitations. And uh, went to the emergency room Thursday afternoon. Um, got some new medications that seemed to satisfy them, so I'm back home wondering what's next. But she said, I was going to send a note about Bonnie and Dwayne lining me up with her brother Wally <laughs> for my first date. She said, they had a good laugh from the front seat watching Wally and me. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, I'd like to know more about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, actually, uh, that was in the Chronicles. We stayed up late, my wife and oh. I, Allison, reading the Chronicles. And it said, uh, it said, I went on my first date and had my first kiss and my brother my, my brother and sister watched from the front seat. <laughs> oh, There's a whole page called First Kisses. It gets even more interesting. <laughs> and this one is from Helen. Um, Dwayne was seven years older than I was and he married young and moved out when I was around 12, so we didn't have a lot of contact. I spent my junior and senior year in Fargo at a Catholic high school and moved to Seattle after graduation. That's where I got to know Dwayne and his family a lot more. We also had family reunions every few years, which was great fun for all. Dwayne had a playful nature. He always seemed to have this grin on his face, and you had the feeling he knew something you didn't. I always <laughs> admired his willpower. When he decided to quit smoking and drinking, he just did it. He understood the harm of alcoholism. Bonnie and I used to have some great political discussions. We were on the same side, but she helped me look at things a little differently. Dwayne would get his 10 cents in also. Dwayne also loved to get philosophical. We had a lot of fun conversations. So his mechanical abilities were phenomenal. He was amazing in how he could build things. He went, I know he went to a trade school in Wapton, but I'm sure Dad also taught him a lot. He was quite a guy. I did get to celebrate his 89th birthday with him and some family and valued that time. The most important thing is he believed in Jesus as his Savior, and that is by far the very best thing we could hope for, and what matters the most. Mm -hmm. Time on this earth is short, but eternity is a long, long time, so it's nice to know where he is. So sorry I can't be there with you all, but I do send a hug and my love, Helen. With that, I'll just turn it over to Bruce sends this letter. Dwayne, uh was 11 years older than I, so I, don't, I didn't really spend time with him until I reached eight or nine years old. Our dad had a block plant in the late 40s, around 1949. He showed me how to stack pallets in the, black, in the back of the block machine. Dwayne was usually in the yard moving gravel, pallet racks, etc., but on occasion he'd check on me. When there was an ample supply of blocks, Dwayne would often haul gravel to restock the plant. He also hauled spring water to farmers. At times I would see him un unloading gravel in the yard and ask if I could ride along. On the way to and from the gravel pit, he'd often sing aloud and poke fun at me. I, being a curious kid, always asked him questions about how the truck or gravel loader worked, and he'd show me or explain the mechanics. On really hot days, he'd even stop at a small gas station on the edge of town and buy us a cold pop, a big treat in those days. Looking back, I think he took me along just to have someone to listen to him sing. How much is that doggy in the window? But it was still fun. Another way I spent time with him, uh, he was often out in Dad's shop working on equipment, usually late in the night. I'd go see him busily working away and ask lots of questions. Again, he loved explaining things. His mind was like a gearbox, churning ideas and solutions. What little spare time he had, he also spent in the shop building or fixing things for himself, like a go-kart, a small tractor, repair or paint his car, and so on. He seemed his only, it seemed his only clothes were dirty coveralls and a welder's cap. His glasses were always pitted from welding or torch sparks. When he did dress up, I didn't recognize him. <laughs> As time went on, him being 26 and I around 15, gumbo is the name that I gave him when we worked together laying water line or bridging. He usually operated the old backhoe and crane, and I was the one with the idiot stick, shovel, down in the, pitcher, the ditch or pit. 
To break the monotony as he dug, he would swing the bucket over my head and pur purposely shake it to drop small globs of mud on my back. Of course, I re reacted by making a mud ball or two to throw at him as he sat in the cab, grinning from ear to ear. That's the name Gumbo. Back then, we had wet, gooey clay gumbo between 1950 and 57. We shared many work experiences together. He was a hardworking and caring brother who taught me a lot and had my back. I also visited him, Bonnie, and the kids at their home, even babysitting the kids at times in the late 50s. I missed them after they moved to Seattle, but kept and used the knowledge that he taught. However, we weren't apart for long. In late 59, after high school graduation, I also went west and stayed with him and his family for a short time. As usual, besides his day job as a fabricator and welder, in his spare time he was building kitchen cabinets in his garage. He just couldn't sit still. He continued to design, build, and fix things. A month after I arrived in Seattle, a guy was fired at Dwayne's job, so he got me hired. It was a fabrication shop that built large air cylinders to unload rail cars. Again, Dwayne was the master mechanic and fabricator who had made many changes and improved production. The boss was amazed at his talent and work ethic, asking me if there were any more like him in North Dakota. <laughs> During this time, I got into a car wreck with my 56 Ford Fairlane, and guess who I turned to? Dwayne, who had a small garage next to his house where he took out the dents, repaired the front end, repainted the entire car, and it never looked better. To this day, I have a picture of him and I standing beside it. After a year or so at the air cylinder company, we both moved on. He started his own fabrication business in Kent, Washington. In early 60, after being apart for a couple of years, I went to work for him. He would tackle any job that came in the door. Everything from winches for the Navy, cardboard compactors for a major store, a hydraulic press, self-propelled irrigation machines, and so on. Although he was given blueprints, he almost always ignored them and used truck chalk instead and drew his revised plan on the shop floor <laughs> or on scratch paper. Everything was in fact in his mind. It was amazing to see the end result. I learned so much from him over the next four to five years. I still use some of his principles today. To think he had only an eighth grade education and could do what he did was so astounding. He taught me so much to help me become a top journeyman machinist for years to come. One principle he used was so simple but effective. He would say, in your mind, when you challenge something that's big, make it small, and if it's small, make it big. Common sense was always at his core in doing things. No doubt in Dwayne's earlier years, our dad had a lot to do with his work ethic and many skills too. Hats off to both for their genius. There's so much more I would like to say, but it wasn't all work and no play. Although he did love to work, he also had a playful side. When we built the irrigation machine, we were watering a large cornfield in Kent Valley next to Main Highway. Periodically, cars would drive by, so when we were, we were close to the road, he'd turn the water gun on and spray the cars as they went by, and he'd chuckle and yell, free car wash. <laughs> we also went hunting, played horseshoes in his backyard, had family gatherings, but mostly shared many laughs while working together. Many times we had to laugh just to keep from crying. To wrap this up, here's a true story. In the early 60s, when I moved back to Washington from Montana, maybe not Montana, MT. Montana. Yeah. Montana, okay. I had an old 52 Plymouth to get around in. When I told Dwayne I was going to, uh, going to soon get rid of it, he looked it over and said uh, it had a Hemi engine, so he offered me 50 bucks. A few weeks later, I got another car, so I dropped off the old Plymouth. At that time, I was working elsewhere, so I didn't see him too often. A couple of months later, when I went by to visit him. He was digging a ditch in his backyard with a homemade backhoe. I asked where he got that at. He smiled and said, well, that's your Plymouth. Ha, ah, that was my brother Dwayne, making something out of nothing. God bless and keep you, brother. Thanks for the lessons and memory. And best of all, you are with Jesus now. To read a verse. Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I will not be in need. He lets me lie down in green pastures and he, lies, he, he leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for the sake of his name. 
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil and my cup overflows. Certainly goodness and faithfulness will follow me all the days of my life, and my dwelling will be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Um, Rana is going to come up and share for a minute. It's kind of a unique circumstance because we're going to lay Dwayne to rest, but we're also going to lay Paula to rest. She's been sleeping.